Greetings, brethren. It is truly a um, wonderful experience to be here, and my wife and I certainly wish to express our gratitude to all of you for the warm welcome, and also just for most of all for the fact that you have been willing to stand up for the truth, and you have been willing to be counted. This is a happy day for my wife and me, but it's also in some ways a sad day, and not because I'm looking back not because we haven't counted the cost or we don't know what we're doing. I've been counting the cost for years. When I um, left home in 1948 to enter Ambassador College, my parents virtually disowned my, brothers, uh, some, uh, my brother and me and said, well, if you go to that Armstrong College, we'll never give you a dime. And they didn't. Later, my father softened, began to send contributions to the Worldwide Church of God, and my mother mentioned an interest in wanting to be baptized, but unfortunately she fell and hit her head and, and died, though, I think in about her middle 60s, and was never baptized, my father or mother. I've had a lot of um, family opposition over the years, and uh, of course, I realize the step my wife and I are taking will not in any way be understood by the vast majority of my thousands of friends in the Worldwide Church of God they will not understand it now, but they will understand it later. Now, through the years, uh, Mr. Meredith and I have compared notes. As you may know, we were ones who went to Mr. Armstrong and um, was were trying to get him to realize what was happening to put the church back on the track. And, and, and God did use us, Doc, uh, Mr. Meredith, uh, in the... Uh, had over the ministerial services for uh, some time and me over the college to put the college back on the track. But unfortunately, we have not, we have not been happy, let's say, to see some of the trends, and I'm speaking primarily of doctrine. I'm not talking about administrative uh, matters. That's another thing that I, I don't need to get into. But through the years, we've seen things that we felt were not biblical, certainly which we would not teach or preach and have not. But the last time we got together in the flesh was at the uh, Feast of Tabernacles in Palm Springs. I was given, I guess, a couple sermons. Dr. Meredith had a prayer that he was given. <laughs> and we compared notes, and certainly we could see things were, from a doctrinal standpoint, the pot was boiling. And it could not be much longer until some of us would have to stand up for the truth, which we fully have intended to do if, if uh, that was necessary, not that we wanted to. I've served in God's work for 44 years. I went on my first baptismal tour 44 years ago, and I think I went on about six or seven baptismal uh, tours. I pastored, I counted up the other day, 12 or 13 churches. I served as regional director of the work in Britain from 1958 to 1973. At the same time, served as deputy chancellor of the college there from 1960 through 73, and then for about nine or over nine years, I guess it was here, until I was sent to New Zealand to be regional director of the work of God in the South Pacific. And um, as well as serving as writer and editor. Uh, one time, I think I had three articles. I, it sort of embarrassed me in the plain truth. There were, uh, I know two, but I believe there was one time for some reason they put three of my articles, and I used to write late at night uh, w in the wee hours, but uh, in more recent years, uh, Dr. Meredith and I haven't contributed that much, and there are numerous reasons for that I won't go into. But I did serve as writer and editor. I've done quite a bit of editing, and uh, this was the first book I ever wrote, Key to Northwest European Origins. It is showing the, the historical basis proving that the Celtic peoples, who were the ancient Britons that came into the British Isles, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, the ancestors of those peoples, before the Angles and Saxons came in, in the 5th century A.D. They came in later, but the ancient uh, Celts or Celts came in, Dr. Meredith spoke, uh, his ancestors, the Welsh, my, uh, my ancestors, uh, certainly on my father's side, the Scots, even though I have ancestors that go back to the Norman French on about, I think, 15 of the English kings, to William the Conqueror and Pepin, uh, his grandfather, I think it was, over in France. But this was the first book I wrote. I think uh, Dr. Meredith has uh, perused it. 
it has a lot of the historical proofs because, and I won't get into this today, the historical proofs that I will be going into, but there's a great deal to show that the peoples who came into England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, and also some of the other nations of Northwest Europe, that those peoples indeed showed they came from the very area of the Caspian Sea that our ancestors, where they, our ancestors were placed in those captivities and deportations back in the 730s and the final one in 721 B.C. when uh, Samaria fell, the capital city, and uh, the rump state had been pretty well destroyed before that by the Assyrians. And there's a great deal of history, brethren, to support that. And I've got it, and I've been collecting it for years, and we intend to make that known. Dr. Meredith has indicated that the historical uh, proofs, many of them, showing where those peoples from England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, as well as, as other, uh, in other areas, uh, Mr. Repartian has, has written a very interesting book that I've read and have a copy of uh, showing where the French came from and showing, let's say, connections with Palestine, the ancient uh, peoples of Reuben, but I don't want to uh, digress on that today. But brethren, there is a great deal of information to prove it historically. But later on, and I'm not ready to start the sermon, I have still have some announcements to make, uh, <laughs> but anyway, later on, I will, I will get into the biblical proofs that we know what basically Mr. Armstrong put in that book, The U.S. and Britain and Prophecy. We know it is true, and there's no re reason to doubt it to be skeptical, to shelve it for two or three years, while some skeptics uh, who haven't proven these things, uh, while they um, sip tea or coffee or whatever and, um, and uh, try to make up whether or not it's true, make up their, their, their mind. Anyway, I just thought I would uh, again bring you greetings from the Brethren in the South Florida. The church is there. And um, I'm, I'm serving as a pastor of two churches, a little over 500, I think, of, on the rolls there. And uh, I would, before I forget it, like to ask your prayers in a couple matters. Uh, my um, wife's sister called uh, just before we left the house and said that her brother, uh, Jim Lombardo, or Lombard, I guess, <laughs> is, uh, that um, he had a heart attack. He had had. He's not in the church, but he had had a heart attack some, um, oh, about a year ago, and seemed to be doing okay, and he just had a heart attack and is in the hospital. So, uh, you know, the Bible doesn't just say pray for people in the church. I think you know. So anyway, uh, my wife asked that I would uh, request your prayers, if at all uh, possible, that God would intervene. And uh, so please remember Mr. Jim Lombard. Actually, my wife, uh, most people, when they tell them she's Italian, her father and more, mother were born in Italy, but members of their family were red-haired, some of them. Uh, they were the Lombards, and I, I don't want to digress on that. They were, uh, if not relatives of the Israelites, certainly very closely akin to the Israelites. I don't want to get into that today either. But they came from North Germany up around the uh, Baltic and came down into Italy and, as, we, as I say, raised hell or were hell raisers or whatever. And that's not a bad word. It's in the Bible, you know, or we use repeatedly. Um, <laughs> And my wife likes to organize everybody and everything, and she's a real organizer and, and, and very helpful. Uh, and I think the, the Lombards, a very a comparatively small tribe, they really did pretty well organize Italy until Charlemagne went down. He's my, one of my ancestors, according to the uh, uh, scrolls that, that I, I have, uh, have been put together, of uh, one of my cousins. Um, anyway, um, then finally Charlemagne went down and uh, brought them into to tow. And after that, the Lombards stayed, I think, primarily and more in the northern part of Italy. But um, anyway, please remember Mr. Jim Lombard or Lombardo, the long beards. That's what it means. Another thing, I'd like to ask your prayers before getting into the sermon. Um, please uh, pray that God will help my wife and me to find a home. Uh, we're having to uh, move out here. Uh, we just got unpacked. Uh, I have over a thousand books. And I groan inwardly every time I think of moving. And we have too much furniture and all sorts of things and that we collected that we should give away or throw away or, or something. But anyway, be that as it may, it's uh, quite a problem to move, especially international move. And it took us months, and my wife uh, hadn't been feeling too well, and we just sort of paced ourselves. And we just got unpacked when, when uh, these things began to break, and we knew that it might mean, it might mean, uh, that we would um, uh, have to move. Well, anyway, um, 
in order to serve in God's work, we do need to. And in fact, we're living in the most beautiful, nicest home we've ever lived in with a nice swimming pool, a new home, a model home that we were able to get for half the price of the one we had in Pasadena. So it was uh, uh, quite a blessing. And we fixed it up and improved it and all that and have ducks coming right up in the canal. My wife feeds them. She's got her own little following there, you know, a bunch of ducks. They think she's God. And they come up and uh, begging for food and uh, the swans and the birds and, and the little geckos and, and uh, uh, thunder clouds in, in South Florida. You'd never, you, you wouldn't understand. It's the thunder capital, they say, of the world. The most beautiful fireworks I've ever seen that makes the Rose Parade, you know, January, uh, no, Fourth of July fireworks. I mean, makes it seem like it's Dellsville. But um, anyway, we're, um, we're going to have to um, sell a home and move out here. We've been looking for a home. We've looked at, I think, about 10. And we, uh, we found one that we think may be the one God would uh, want us to have. So if you would pray that God would lead us to the right home uh, and um, that we will be able to make the smooth, uh, a fairly smooth transition because it is a lot of work. And my wife's age, she doesn't like me to say this, but she's in her 60th year. I'm an old man. I'm in my uh, 64th year right now. And um, so anyway, uh, you know, as, as you get older, you don't like to move as much. You don't like to travel as much and all that. But still, uh, with God's help, if he'll give us the strength, we're willing to. And if it means moving a dozen times or two dozen times to stand up for the truth and make sure that God's people know the real truth, we're willing to do it. And we're not looking back. So please understand that. I would like to say this, that I understand in the announcement made this morning, and I, I don't think anyone was necessarily trying to uh, hopefully be too negative or anything, and the announcement's made in one of the churches in Southern California, but I understand that uh, it was mentioned that uh, I, I'm um, going with my brother-in-law, Mr., uh, uh, Mr. Meredith. Well, that happens to be true, but I won't tell you the reason I am here this afternoon is not because he is my brother-in-law, or it's not because... Uh, many times, and we've discussed, we have been best friends now for about 40 years. Uh, when we compared notes last fall and saw things uh, coming to the boiling point, and then I want to tell you what finally sparked it to me. It was when this awful book, <laughs> I, I mean this, and I'm not, I'm not trying to ridicule anyone, God Is was published. That's the worst book that has ever been published under the name Church of God that I've ever seen, and certainly Worldwide Church of God. When I got it, and I frankly was so busy with problems I was handling in the two-church area, and it was not until sometime after the feast that I finally got to go through it. Now, when I read a book, I always do this. My wife never likes to read anything I've marked up. <laughs> that's the way, I, that's, that's the way I, I, I mark books. Well, I, when I read this book through and marked it up, I, I could hardly believe my eyes. I had an open mind. So eventually, when I got the time... I wrote a uh, critique, an 18-page, which would be about the equivalent of 45 or 50 pages in an ordinary book. It's 18, a single space on, you know, ordinary eight and a half by 11 page. And I wrote that to Pasadena to try to get some answers. Why we were turning away from the basic concept of who and what God is. No longer believing that God is a family. No longer believing that God is reproducing himself. Not even believing that God is made in the form and image of, uh, you know, uh, well, the same basic form and image that man has because he made man in his form and image and waffling around and, and just making statement after statement that was totally unbiblical. And this I found quite disconcerting and, and disturbing. And I had uh, a, a few people in the area bring up some objections. And I was trying my very best to be loyal, to be positive in, in reading this book. There are a few good points in the book. I can turn to one place. And, um, but anyway, I, 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 I wrote a critique, and I was very frank, but I, I tried to be respectful, and I mean that. And brethren, let's be respectful to the Worldwide Church of God and the other churches and to the ministers. Uh, after all, that is the largest uh, church of God on the earth today and will continue to be for some time. I'm not sure it will be at the end of this age, frankly. Not unless the, the, the leaders uh, get in charge of the doctrines and, and kick out Protestantism that is just flooding into a number of the teachings and writings of, of sermons I've heard from headquarters of uh, statements made in, in, um, in doctrinal meetings. And one of the uh, leading uh, people had said that we're 95% Protestant. Well, I don't know that, that um, 
uh, what the percentage is, but I know there's a lot of Protestantism that, that has been creeping into and a lot of false doctrines into our literature lately and our sermons and various things. And um, so anyway, the reason I am here then is because, and I tried to get some answers. I got some replies, but no answers. And I've written all together uh, over a couple hundred pages on various aspects of doctrine trying to get some answers. I haven't yet sent all of them in because if I couldn't even get answers in the one booklet, what about a lot of the other or uh, numerous other uh, doctrinal areas that, uh, that need to be uh, looked at and, and reevaluated? But I've got replies, but as I've told the men, no answers. And I, so my wife and I came out. We had not finally made up our mind until last Tuesday. But if, if we could not get some answers and um, uh, some answer from the Word of God, we were going to then uh, certainly support the truth. We were not going to c continue to follow a leadership that is following uh, down a Protestant road. That's uh, what, it, uh, what it boils down to. And so uh, there are three reasons why my wife and I then withdrew from the, the, our former church. Three reasons. The first is doctrinal. Erroneous doctrines that have crept in or been foisted upon God's people sort of stealthily, very cleverly. And some of you, when you read some of these things, you don't have the perception even to see them. And you analyze the words and then you can see. If, and I, I sleep not only with a Bible by my bed, but by a dic uh, dictionary by my bed. And I have for years because when I hear words I don't know, I go and look them up or words that I know, but I want to sharpen my understanding. And I don't intend to let anybody pull the wool over my eyes by any what you might call semantic jiggery-pokery or using a lot of, uh, of, of flowery words or big words, Mr. Armstrong always spoke in plain, simple language. And that's why the magazine was called The Plain Truth. It was a truth made very plain. It wasn't, it wasn't written and couched in erudite, scholarly uh, words with big, you know, uh, $10 uh, or $20 words. It was, you know, little words that could be understood and that have more... Uh, uh, understanding, that is, that give more understanding to the average person. But anyway, there are three reasons why we're here. The first is doctrinal, the second is doctrinal, and the third is doctrinal. Administrative things I may not have agreed with, and there have been some, uh, those are minuscule, those are minor. The, uh, the reasons we're here are, uh, that we are here is because the, of these serious doctrinal errors that are being taught and have been taught and written, and I've got them marked, and I could give you some, but that's not the purpose. I'm going to give, I hope I have time uh, for uh, at least part of a sermon later. So I thought I would just explain why we're here. And um, I'm not here because my brother-in-law was here. We discussed these things last fall, and, and, and in fact, before Dr. Meredith uh, made his decision, he he, uh, as my, uh, as my uh, longtime friend, as, as well as brother-in-law, uh, we discussed some of the, the, the serious concerns we had, and certainly I could not disagree at all uh, from the beginning that uh, he was forced, I feel, to take the action he did, and in that way, in my heart, I was supportive, even though as long as I remained in the Worldwide Church of God, I did not intend to be subversive and disloyal, and if there had been a turnaround, and if when, when we had... Uh, uh, many hours with um, with um, uh, Fitchells at the um, headquarters recently. If I had seen uh, a, a, a um, an understanding of even the problem and the willingness to correct it, uh, I'd, I uh, certainly would would have been glad to remain in the Worldwide Church of God. But there would be such massive changes from the way the church has been going with these people who've gone to the theology departments of of, of this world's religions and who, um, I can show you by their own statements, think that, you know, these people have uh, come up with a lot of good things, got a, a lot of good theology, these theologians. And uh, they don't even realize that they've been sucked in, hook, line, and sinker, and uh, have gone into serious error. And therefore, I'm not convinced that God is going to change from within. I think that um, I can serve God better without such an organization where I can preach the truth in, in boldness, uh, where we can, where we can, uh, we can um, uh, preach God's word, and not have to worry about fighting uh, or you know striving with words and people who want to go off in a Protestant, uh, in a, in a, in a, down a Protestant alley, as it were. So this is not a family affair. 
Please understand that. Unless you speak of the divine family, I'm here because I believe that God has a family and God is a family and that God is reproducing himself and that we someday will no longer be humans. We will no longer be, uh, I mean, we won't be angels. We will be even higher than angels. We will be uh, sons and daughters in the very family of God Almighty. Nothing less. Now, we will never have the same experience that God has. We will never have the same power, uh, the omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence in the same way that, that God has. And we will never, we will always be junior members in that family, but we will be children of God and are called that. Sons and daughters, 2 Corinthians 6, 18. And it says, we'll look on God's face as you read there in Revelation 21 and 22. Revelation 21, I think it's about verse um, 6 or 7. But anyway, we'll look on God's face and we'll be his children, his sons and daughters. And we're, we won't be adopted children. We will be actually born of God and born of the Spirit. So don't, you know, the Bible certainly shows we're not his adopted children. Uh, we are born of God. We're actually of his seed. You read that in the Bible. And, um, and so anyway, that's why I'm here. It's not because of a human connection. Now, by that, I don't in any way mean to, uh, to uh, shall I say, uh, minimize uh, family connections. They're important. Um, I've spent, I guess, literally hundreds, well, thousands of hours, I'm sure, with Dr. Meredith. We went on a baptismal tour. Uh, we've been in each other's homes on, I guess, hundreds or thousands of occasions. And I've always known him to be a man of integrity, a man of truth, a man wh whose word you can count on, a man of courage, uh, a, a man of boldness, uh, a man that I believe is a man of God and a man who will not compromise with sin or with false doctrine. And I hope I'm such a person and uh, God is the judge, but I believe I am because I went, I'll just say I went to Mr. Armstrong with the first uh, doctrinal change, major change in this era or in this century, Pentecost, when uh, all the other evangelists, uh, I could mention their names, had said, don't go to Mr. Armstrong because, you know, if you do, uh, was one evangelist said, you got ten times more guts than I do if you go to Mr. Armstrong. And the other one, who was at that time um, high up in the, uh, among the evangelists, said, well, if Raymond McNair goes to see Mr. Armstrong discuss this Pentecost thing, he better take a parachute with him. <laughs> I went to see Mr. Armstrong. It was the most difficult about an hour uh, a meeting I've ever had with anyone. Not, and I expected it to be because I knew Mr. Armstrong had strong convictions and I knew he didn't change quickly or easy. Now, you see, I'm not against change. I'm not against change. I even spearheaded this particular change on Pentecost. Well, eventually, Mr. Armstrong, after telling me he thought I was trying to destroy the church and uh, a few things like that, uh, I told him, I, I said, Mr. Armstrong, um, one of these ministers that left the church is taking members all the time, and I think we're wrong. It looks like we may be wrong. I believe you ought to really look at it, sir, and I believe that you better, you know, we better look at it. And I wasn't 100% certain, but it looked like we were wrong. Well, anyway, I la he later called me in his uh, office. Uh, he, um, uh, he read a letter he had written to the uh, brethren. I, I'm sure there's a copy. Uh, one of you might have a copy. He said that uh, Raymond McNair had just come in his office, had uh, revealed some things, and he was looking into it and, and so forth. Well, anyway, then later there was DNR and our old position of divorce and remarriage. And even though uh, at first that wasn't easy for me to understand, I think it was at least a month for both Dr. Meredith and I after proving these things, even after Mr. Armstrong pronounced them, in May 74, I believe it was, uh, we still proved them. I won't teach something I don't believe in. I just never would. I wouldn't teach, uh, teach something I didn't believe in for all the gold in Fort Knox. Money would mean nothing. And you cannot prostitute your conscience. You cannot defile your conscience. You cannot preach something that you do not believe is in the Word of God. In fact, I have a quote from the Pastor General here, and he says, anyway, our loyalty is to the Word of God and not to, to tradition, and I agree with that. Uh, I, I could read it, but uh, anyway, I've got too many things to read and too little time in which to read them. And um, well, anyway, so my uh, immediate problem began right here with this book, and I've got uh, replies, but I feel no real answers, and I've been unable at, at any level, uh, after talking to numerous people uh, at headquarters recently, coming out here at our own expense, I've been unable to get any real answers any real answers. And I don't want to go into details. Uh, uh, the, the pastor general was very uh, convivial, very congenial, and very patient and listened uh, all together, I think nearly five hours uh, in two different meetings. And we tried to be very respectful, but uh, I tried to be uh, uh, rather frank. 
and showing what's happening and basically what the problem is and I don't even know that it's understood is that some liberal theologians shot full of Protestant theology have seized control of the top positions in the worldwide church unfortunately that's my my opinion and um, and I don't believe it, it's even understood and they've gotten in control and um, and until uh, until uh, someone that has the power to say look we've taken a wrong track then this church or, or the uh, the church will continue to go in the wrong direction and I don't intend when if I see a, a I'm on a boat and it's heading toward a cliff or a, toward a boulder or something uh, you know you better jump ship if you need to and get in the boat uh, you better you, uh, either that or if you can get to the captain if he can begin turning the ship around but I'm convinced that some of us have to stand up brethren for the truth and as I said this is not in one way a happy day for me it is it's a happy day but it's twinged with sadness I mean that sincerely because I love these people and I don't want to ever say anything against any of the leaders in the in the uh, church that I've uh, come from uh, I, I will speak the truth and that may hurt and some may not like it but it will not be a, an attack ever and I'm sure Dr. Meredith, or Mr. Meredith, I guess he prefers to be called, but has said the same thing, that I will not attack people, but I will attack error. I will attack wrong doctrines that are leading God's people down the wrong road and are going to lead some into the lake of fire if they, if they can't see because these things are very, very serious. And so that's why we're here, as I said. It really is all on doctrine. I just heard in the, one of the announcements made this morning in Southern California that it said that I don't believe in the change in makeup. Well, that's one area. I've never met any minister, to my knowledge, or virtually none, uh, that doesn't feel that we were a little overboard in that area, that a little, little makeup uh, used judiciously, not for the sake of vanity, is all right. And my wife wears a little makeup. And, and, uh, and uh, when, when there was a ruling by Mr. Armstrong, we shouldn't. She took it off uh, in order not to offend anyone, but we didn't necessarily think it was wrong. And so I don't know where someone got the idea that I didn't agree with, with that change. But brethren, the main changes that have been made aren't cosmetic. They're not cosmetic changes. They are deep changes. And I can't even, after months, and writing back and forth and writing, um, I guess, upwards of 50, no, more like 100 pages to one of the chief theologians, I can't even get his concept of now, if, if God isn't the Father, you know, if God isn't a supreme... Uh, family with two persons but is somehow one entity as they say and they're not two uh, two persons as the, the January uh, PT said I can't even uh, get from them anyone exactly what their new concept of God is if you destroy what what we were taught from the Bible and by Mr. Armstrong honestly I have talked to people and I still cannot get it after several months and many sincere uh, letters written back or uh, lengthy letters giving the scriptural teachings and views so, as I said, we're here for three reasons. Doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. That's everything. You can't have unity just by love alone. And you read Mr. Armstrong's article, and he says it also has to be based on truth, and thy word is truth, so you have to have love. You bet. That's a very important. But love alone is not, al uh, is not um, an enough. Uh, love is not, it, it's not uh, against law. It's not against doctrine, true doctrine, true law, as I believe you had a sermon on this, showing that the law of God is love. Love toward God, first and foremost, and love toward your neighbor. And God's law, uh, law is mercy and love and humility and everything good. That's what God's law is because it is an expression of the character of God Almighty. And don't you ever let anybody else tell you it isn't. That law is love. That law is mercy. But, um, of course, the same one who gave that law through the blood of Christ, we know, has to, has to forgive us when we break that law. And um, uh, certainly that we all understand. So my serious difficulties all began with the God is booklet. And I've been told it'll be revised by one of the chief theologians in the, uh, in the church, but he said it won't be revised along the lines you've suggested. Well, if it isn't, it'll, it'll, it'll uh, certainly not continue to teach the truth because I know what the truth is about God and who he is, and no one's going to confuse me. I don't have any doubts. God is a family, and you have the Father as one person or being or entity, a spirit being. You have the Son 
neither of which are omnipresent, and they're nowhere in the Bible told, uh, said that they are omnipresent. You have the Holy Spirit, which is not a person, not a separate being, not an entity, but according to Jeremiah 23, 23 and other scriptures, God fills heaven and earth, he says, and his spirit is everywhere. It permeates everything, every molecule, every atom, every quark. Uh, is energized by that, by, by that power and energy that comes from God and the very material universe was created out of the, the dynamic energy of the power of God. I've got even a second, a second or secular article that mentions that. Anyway, so now let me see. When do you close here? Is it uh, 4 o'clock, isn't it? Well, I'm going to start on, an, on a sermon and I, I believe I'll be invited back to this pulpit, pulpit maybe in about a month or a little over. It's going to take us some time. We have some things that have to be done and we're going to take however long we need to because I don't want to see my wife in a casket. And, and she, she was very sick after that uh, um, international move. And, um, and um, so I don't want to be without a wife. Uh, but uh, I hope we can be out here as near the 1st of June as possible. But it's going to be very difficult to get everything together. I can't go into it here and get out here by that time. But in the meantime, I'll be doing some writing and uh, certainly we'll be very busy, and that's part of our job, just moving out here. That's part of work and, uh, and so forth. Well, I'm going to start then, brethren, on a sermon, and it looks like I won't get very far in it today, but that's okay. There will be other times. I'd like to start then on a sermon since, as we know, uh, one of, uh, in fact, I'd say the most important booklet probably that the Worldwide Church of God ever published was the U.S. and Britain in prophecy. And the reason I say that, because I was asked to teach a class to all the ministers from around the world who came in the ministerial refreshing program, and for about a year and a half or two years, I taught every session, and I showed from, both, uh, from the Bible, but mainly I think I stressed some of the historical proofs in those sessions, which uh, some may have forgotten. And um, yet, that book, brethren, has been sidelined now for, I believe, it's well over two years. Now, I've got some copies here of some material I wrote to people who were working on that booklet. In fact, I think they still believe in it. I know one of them does. And I wrote and I gave them some historical uh, uh, clues and information where they could get the facts to prove from history as well as the Bible that uh, what Mr. Armstrong wrote in the U.S. and Britain, British Commonwealth and Prophecy is indeed biblical. Since when do we kill a booklet before you, you, you prove that it's, that it's in error. Now, I've proven these things, brethren. I did years ago. My thesis, in which I spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours, working, sometimes drinking coffee, which maybe I shouldn't have, and with honey and pure milk and cream in it, and sitting up till all night sometimes. <laughs> and this was my first book that I wrote, 300 and some pages, Key to Northwest European Origins. And I, I bring the Bible in, but it shows from history uh, where these Anglo-Saxon Celtic peoples came from. And I'll just say here, and I'll give you some of that, God willing, in a future sermon. They came from the area of the Caspian Sea. That's what book after book after book that I have says. And that's exactly where we would expect them to come for the reason that I'll give you this afternoon from the Word of God. And so this afternoon, I'm going to have to stay off of history primarily. Uh, I've just touched on it briefly. But I want to get right into the Bible and show you and something I wrote actually intending it to submit to headquarters, but since I hadn't got any answers from just the critique of the God Is booklet, I didn't want to give them overload by sending in too much else, and so I have not submitted that, but I'll give some of it to you. Uh, five, I've got it, five biblical proofs supporting uh, what basically Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong said in his book, The U.S. and British Commonwealth in Prophecy. Uh, now, by the way, let me say something, lest people misunderstand. I have never said, and I've wrote, written this to the men in, in Pasadena, I've said, I do not believe in drawing a circle around anybody's uh, doctrines, in this case, Mr. Armstrong's, uh, like at the time he, he died, and you, where you could never make a change. I'm, I'm not uh, one that believes that we should do like some churches have done, where they had a, a founder of their religion when they died, that they, they um, took their writings and sort of make that as their Bible. Uh, I do not believe that. I do not believe we should set in concrete every word Mr. Armstrong wrote in, in this wonderful book, Mystery of the Ages, uh, or which, which has been um, uh, discredited and, and destroyed because it was felt too many errors were in it. Wonderful book filled with wisdom that explains the major mysteries. 
that Satan doesn't want his church to have and doesn't want the world to have. But these mysteries will be, will be made known. Believe me, they will be made known. And Dr. Um, Meredith is, uh, has already discussed with me an article that will certainly begin with one of them. And I would hope I could go ahead with a, a series perhaps in, in, in somewhat the same uh, fashion. But these mysteries will be made known to God's church and to the world if they want it, I'm sure, in time. But anyway, what are the five biblical proofs? Now, the strongest proof of what Mr. Armstrong wrote is found right in the Bible. And let me say this. And I've got many editions of that U.S. and Britain and Prophecy. And by the way, uh, that, um, that book was the most popular book that's ever been sent out. I think it's done more. I've had people tell me to bring them to baptism. In that book is the gospel. Don't let anybody tell you it isn't. It's, it talks about Jesus Christ and, and the difference between race and grace. And it, in that book, it, it, it contains the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it contains a lot of wonderful truths. It's a very important book. But, of course, Satan doesn't want that to go out. Here we find the blacks. Uh, one of their uh, people wrote a book entitled Roots, and they were excited about that because they, they could learn a little bit more about their background. And I was excited. I even watched some programs, and I have the book by Alex Haley, or I guess it was, who wrote the book and uh, entitled Roots. And I'm happy for them to look into their background. Why do we want to cover up our background? The, uh, the background of where the Anglo-Saxon Celtic peoples came from. And I'm going to show you again from the Bible why we have become the dominant peoples on the earth today, militarily, economically, and any way you want to look at it, and in spite of the fact that we're corrupting many of the blessings that God gave us, or that He gave us, and that we are turning wholesale into every rotten, foul, uh, filthy practice that is going to bring down the judgment, a Sodom-like judgment, upon our people if we don't repent. And you make no mistake about it, according to the Bible. But I'm going to give you those five points. I say, U.S. and B.C. and prophecy, this is an article I wrote that I've not submitted, has been sidelined or, quote, under review now for two years. And I think when I wrote this, it was already two years. I believe it's well over two years. And there's talk that it might, there might be some articles or perhaps a booklet or something like that. Uh, but, but certainly... Yet from some information I have, written information, it is not believed in, at least by some in the top echelons of, of uh, the former organization that I was in. That's a sad fact, brethren, because Mr. Armstrong, right here in this book, I'll just tell you what he said of it, and, and one of his whole chapters explaining the mystery is the mystery of who of the nation of Israel, who they were, and, of course, their modern descendants. But I want to just read here briefly what Mr. Armstrong said regarding this. He says, One cannot understand the real purpose and incredible potential of man without this vital knowledge. Furthermore, that's page 160 of the Mystery of the Ages. Furthermore, in page uh, 164, Mr. Armstrong says, he says that, uh, talks about, uh, people in the world when you begin to explain the truth and he says they jump the track of the truth this is a point where they switch off the track that would lead them to the missing master key now listen to this would lead these people to the missing master key to the prophecies they miss the fact that God gave Abraham promises of physical race as well as spiritual grace and the churches of this world they want to talk about uh, uh, Grace, and that's important, very important. But they want to ignore race. And believe me, and contrary to a writing I have by one of the leaders of, of my former church, believe me, God is not only interested in, in grace, that is, that's the church, that's his primary concern, is calling out the church. We all agree with that. But I can show you there's a great deal in the Bible about race, physical race, and even in the New Testament. If you don't believe that, just turn to a scripture that pops into my mind right now, Romans 3. Notice, what advantage then has the Jew? That was of the race of Israel. That was only, of course, part of the people of Israel. Romans 3, verse 1. Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them, the Jews, were committed the oracles, that is, the words of God. And he said there was an advantage to them you know, to the Jew. You bet there is. And there's an advantage to being 
a, a descendant of Israel. And by the way, many so-called Germans who came over here, and this is a thing I can't cover this afternoon, came through North Germany. Some of them went into Britain after the Roman legions left at about 510 to 550 A.D., when the Romans pulled their legions back uh, from Britain. And then the Angles and the Saxons began pouring in, but the Scots, the Irish, the English, and the Welsh, and some of the Western uh, peoples, of, or that is, of Western Britain, were already there. These ancient Gaelic or Celtic peoples that were closely related, according to all history, in religion, in customs, and even in language, with the, Ga or the Gauls over on the other side of the continent. And they were, as, they were actually relatives. But anyway, when they came into to, um, to Britain, in the, in the uh, years after the Roman legions left, then these people began to form the very uh, concepts, uh, rather the, to fulfill the very prophecies that God had said when he would form a nation and a company of nations. And that was just God's way of bringing this about. But some of those people who went into Britain, and they were known as, they call them German, Germanic tribes as Angles and Saxons and Jutes in the middle of the 400s A.D., some of those peoples, they didn't come to Britain. Rather, they, uh, instead of coming in, into Britain, they later came into the United States directly from North Germany. And I discussed this with Mr. Armstrong, and he said, yes, he thinks perhaps even a few of the peoples in North or Northwest Germany are still some of those Israelites that may have been, uh, you know, that may have uh, lodged there. And that's where our ancestors came. As I'll show you, I've got an ancient map over 300 years old that even on the map shows it was 100 years, printed 100 years before we declared independence. And this map shows uh, covered wagons and people on horses and, and a trail all the way from the Black Sea, which is just, you know, a short distance right from the Caspian Sea, of, of our ancestors coming from that area of the Caucasus up into Northwest Europe, coming across the steppes of South Russia, northern Poland, northern Germany, and into Denmark and that area, and many of them going to the British Isles. And let me say something else, brethren, about change. Some people, uh, one person said, well, you're just loyal. He wrote me, he said, you're just loyal to Mr. Armstrong. You, you, you know, you, you, you uh, won't change. And, um, and I, 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 I would just say that's not true. I've proven that I will change. I, I mentioned two cases uh, under Mr. Armstrong's pastor generalship. I will change if someone can show me from the Bible that it's right. I believe in change, but that's good change, right change. Good change is good. Bad change or change into error is very bad. So remember that. Well, it's not just be against change. Change, good change is good. Bad change or bad or change into error is very, very bad, very deleterious, very destructive uh, of, of uh, well, any, any word you want to use. Now, Let's go on. Mr. Armstrong called this knowledge the master key to the prophecies. They missed the fact that God gave Abram promises of physical race as well as spiritual grace. Now let's look at some of what I call the five biblical supports proving basically that what I'd call the peoples of, uh, and I'll narrow it down to the U.S. And, and Britain, this great nation and the company of nations or commonwealth of nations that we have fulfilled the prophecies that God gave to the patriarchs and let me let me cover that by the way before I start on that though I must give you one other little thing <laughs> don't forget brethren that Mr. Armstrong himself said that he wrote up a, a, a manuscript I think it was two or three hundred pages sent it to the leader of the church of God in his day just this was before he left them in order to start a different work, Mr. Armstrong was ordained in the Church of God by people who laid their hands on him, later began to reject certain truths, and he withdrew from fellowshipping with them, and God started a different work through Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong. I think you can find a parallel in what's happening today. But I want you to notice uh, here, as I've got it marked, I, I'll just read something I've written up here. It won't take very long. Then I'll get into the sermon. Well, I'm into it, but, <laughs> but I haven't gotten into uh, some of the uh, scriptures back in Genesis that I wanted to. Listen, quote, I believe there are many important truths contained in Mr. Armstrong's U.S. and B.C. and Prophecy book. Should we uh, do what the uh, so-called Sardis people did, that is the Seventh-day Church of God, who were, we believe, rather lax in, in their doctrines, when Mr. Armstrong submitted his manuscript consisting of the, quote, Anglo-Israel truth, end quote, to a leader of that 
uh, one branch of the, that is to one branch of the Seventh Day Church of God, he, the leader, acknowledged that this material was important, but he and the church he presided over never used it. Why not? Now, this prominent Seventh Day Church of God leader, Mr. Andrew N. Duggar, wrote a letter to Mr. Armstrong in July 1929. This letter was written on stationery of the, quote, General Conference of the Church of God and was dated July 28, 1929. Here's what Mr. A. N. Duggar admitted in that letter to Mr. Armstrong. Dear Brother Armstrong, and I've, I've just uh, I've cut out a little bit here, but I'm, I'm giving about half of what he wrote. I'm giving all the essentials. And, Dear Brother Armstrong, I have just finished, that is reading, the manuscript, British Israel, with the illustrations and maps. You have put much work on this, and I am, am impressed to write you right now, while the matter is fresh on my mind, of how it has interested me. I have seen no work near its equal in clearness and completeness. You surely are right. And while I cannot use it in the paper at the present, you may be assured that your labor has surely not been in vain. There is a purpose in your having gone into this matter so deeply right at this time, which is not difficult for me to fully see through, and you will hear more of these truths and the light therein revealed later. End quote. A. N. Duggar. But he never used it. The Church of God never did. Now, God inspired Mr. Armstrong to write this booklet. And then eventually it became, all, well, really a book. And I've got uh, all the editions. And uh, later it, it, um, it had a little more in it. There are a few little errors, I believe. I've discussed that with the, the present leaders. But the basic truths are right bang on. And Mr. Armstrong sent out, in fact, when I taught the, the class, I believe uh, in, in looking at, at some of the, in the front where it told how many had been published, I believe the last... I checked it was between 12 and 15 million copies of this book had been sent out. And I believe it did more to build a church and to, and to even bring people to, to um, a knowledge of, of many important uh, matters in the Bible. And certainly it has about salvation and grace. I believe it did more than any other book. That's my personal feeling. And I, I think uh, Mystery of the Ages would have done more if it hadn't been, uh, hadn't been um, uh, discredited. And, and, of course, uh, destroyed, unfortunately. But I believe this did more to build the work than any other book. And I've talked to people, and, 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 and uh, many, many people have said this. Well, this is what really got me. To, I, I know it was the, the book I found the most fascinating. It definitely was. I remember very differently. By the way, it's interesting to note, as I say here in this paper, that a photocopy of Mr. Duggar's letter appeared in, quote, the Autobiography of Herbert W. Armstrong, Volume 1, page 406, the 1967 edition. However, note this, it is also worth noting that the later 1986 edition, published after Mr. Armstrong's death, you see, of Mr. Armstrong's autobiography, does not include the Duggar letter. Why not? And I've got a copy of that Duggar letter in the page right here if you want to look at it. Uh, any of you want to come up and see it after the sermon? This is in, in the, uh, in the um, uh, autobiography, the 1967 edition, and I think it was a shame that it was left out, and I don't impute motives. I don't know what the motives and why they felt that uh, a lot of other things that were included, pictures and other things were important, but this wasn't. But I thought that was very important to buttress the fact that Mr. Armstrong had, had this important knowledge revealed, which many today, I believe, would want to forget and bury because it shows who we are. And when you know who we are, you know we're the people of God and God gave us laws and you'll know that it's a very important for us to understand our origins because God Almighty has a great deal to say about what will happen to the peoples of Israel in the last days. And we are going into what the Bible called a time of Jacob's trouble such as never existed on this earth. Jeremiah 30, I think it's about verse 7. I'd have to check the exact verse such as never has occurred on this earth until this time no nor ever shall occur. And that's mentioned in Jeremiah 30 and Daniel 12, verse 1. I think it's Matthew 24, verse 21, where it mentions each one is a time that's worse than ever could be, so they have to be the same time. There, you couldn't have three times each one being the worst, you see, because worst is a superlative showing the very 
you know, the, the maximum, the optimum. Okay, let's then look. Today we'll skip over the historical pillars and, and proofs uh, of that, but let's look at, at least uh, start looking at these five important biblical supports. And I'm going to summarize them for you, and then we will, and then we will start on the first one and so forth. Uh, there are um, five basic supports as, as I've analyzed it. Um, first, God Almighty solemnly promised that the descendants of Israel would inherit the fat places of the earth. And that fat places is, is, um, uh, of the earth is quoted from the King James. That is, the choicest portions of this globe, having rich soil constituting the most fertile, productive lands on earth. They would have abundant crops, according to these prophecies and promises, rich deposits of natural resources, that is, iron, coal, oil, etc., the great God promised to give the Israelites immense wealth, material wealth and prosperity. That material abundance would far exceed the physical blessings which a benevolent God would bestow upon the other nations of the world. Now, other nations have some very nice land and inheritances. But I'll tell you, there's a reason why, and I've seen this with my own eyes, having traveled around the world several times, once with Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong, I've seen at U.S. embassies people coming in and lining up with long queues or lines trying to get into the United States. They want to get here because they know we're still by far the most blessed land on the face of the earth in spite of the way we're, squ we're uh, squandering and, and, and wasting our resources and, and we're allowing many, many people to flood into this nation uh, to, uh, in many cases, be a drain and to bring about more crime. Anyway... God Almighty said we would have this mat mat immense material wealth and prosperity. Point number two. The Israelites were destined, according to the prophecies, to possess the national gates, that is, the strategic passes or straits of the world. And maybe I can re refresh your memory, some that you, you'd never even thought of if I get that far this afternoon. And we, the Anglo-Saxon Celtic peoples, and I never just speak of Anglo-Saxons, because that would leave out Dr. Uh, Meredith or Mr. Meredith's ancestors, the Welsh, that would leave out my ancestors on my father's side, the Scots, and it would leave out the, the people of Northern and Southern Ireland, and it would leave out the people of Southwestern England and, and Western Britain and that part who were known to be the ancient Britons, who were um, uh, Celts or Celts, and they were not Angles or Saxons, and they were pushed back into the West by the Angles and Saxons and Jutes when they came in to Britain in the fi uh, middle of the 5th century A.D., so our people would possess those. And no other people in the history of the world, and I've written another history book, by the way, a 700 and some page book, and I've got a lot of uh, material I'd like to put in something someday uh, combining the U.S. and the British Empire and showing the fantastic miracles. It's really a, a, an unbelievable story, but it would take probably 1,000 pages. I'm sure we could never print that and send it out. I may do that when I get too old. Uh, you know, I... Um, I've always said I don't want to, you know, uh, I just don't want to live when I get so old and decrepit uh, that I can't uh, be productive. I certainly didn't want to retire or be retired. And, um, and uh, so I, I've concluded that I don't want to live one day beyond, uh, I'd say, uh, about 115. <laughs> uh, I feel by that time I'll, I'll be uh, too decrepit to uh, preach and teach and write and so forth. Now, God may retire me tonight. I may have a heart attack and be dead. Anyway, you've heard at least some good material. In this, uh, I hope, I hope, biblical material. I hope you'll remember it. Anyway, the third point, proof of the five pillars from the scriptures, and I'm just give, summarizing them, and then we'll start giving you some of the scriptures, is the, the third point, the chosen people, the people of Israel, according to these divinely given predictions and promises, would become a great colonizing people, spreading abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and the south. And all you got to do is take a map of the British Empire and look at the United States and Alaska and the islands we possess and there has, n has never been any people that have spread around the globe to the north and the south and east and west like we have. There's no parallel in all the world and I think I know most of the major battles and, and uh, things that have happened in history as I, uh, history is one of my interests and has been for many years and I know the, um, uh, the, the different wars when they were fought and who they were fought by and I know the Phoenicians uh, had colonies throughout the Mediterranean and Spain and North Africa and Sicily and, and so forth and I know the Greeks established colonies in South Italy and in, in the Mediterranean in many places and I know the Spaniards did and the Portuguese did but I'll tell you what 
The top people of all were the Anglo-Saxon Celtic peoples that spread around to Australia and New Zealand and South Africa and, and Alaska and Hawaii and, um, and uh, across uh, this vast continent, the richest, con the richest, most productive, fertile land with the best growing climate of any spot on earth. If not, you tell me. You tell me what would be, would, would be better than this great land that God gave us. And I've got uh, historical statements by different ones to show the same thing. So we would become a great colonizing people. Point four, the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel would become a great military power who would in the last days, quote, push the nations, that is the non-Israelite nations, is clearly in context, not pushing their own peoples of Israel, push the nations to the ends of the earth. That's Deuteronomy 33, 17. And that did happen, brethren, especially in World War I, when we pushed the central powers back into their, uh, their nations and defeated the central powers. World War II, American and British armies and navies fought around this globe, North Africa and the Middle East, uh, down in, in Iran where British forces were, in, in Asia, in, in uh, you name it, and our forces were all over the world virtually, and our armies and navies, and the only reason Russia kept, was kept in the war was because we sent thousands of planes and tanks and lend lease and foodstuffs and other items to keep Russia from being knocked out of the war. That's something the Russians haven't wanted to admit, but that's a fact, and I can back it up with the statistics, and you can too if you want to look into it. So we would become the greatest military power the earth had ever seen, and America is that. I think the recent coalition down in the Middle East showed when we put our mind to it, if we only want to uh, go to war, then, then we, we have formidable power. And our people have a will. Of course, in, in Vietnam, I personally don't think we should be there. That's another story. I don't think God was in that. And God didn't bless us. And we lost 58,000 men and billions of dollars, a few hundred billions. And, um, and we didn't even go in and we didn't even declare the war. We had our beer and our men in, in Saigon with the ladies of the evening and all the rest. And, and, uh, and uh, a lot of reasons why we were not victorious there. And we finally withdrew. But there were other wars that God has been uh, with us. And God has strengthened us. And I'll show you perhaps one or two of those this afternoon, if time permits, and I don't think it will. <laughs> Point five. That's all right. Uh, as I said, I'll come back and Dr. Meredith Dudman, he's given you some very heavy spiritual m uh, meat, but this, uh, this is an unspiritual, but it's um, of a little different nature, and, and it has been a special subject that I've uh, studied many years and hope to uh, write on and so forth. Point five. God's Word prophesied that the descendants of Israel would possess a great and glorious throne or scepter. This scepter promise would not depart from the Jewish people. That is, the people who were descended of the tribe of Judah would not depart from Judah once it was established among their descendants until Shiloh come. You'll find that in Genesis 49, verse 10. That divinely ordained throne was prophesied to continue in existence as a viable ruling throne from the time when God established it in Judah in the time of David when he first established that throne and put the scepter in a Jew's hand. It had been in Saul's hand before that, a Benjamite. That didn't fulfill Genesis 49, verse 10. But he put it in David's hand, that scepter, the, the, the king's ruling uh, 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 scepter there, and he put it in David's hand, and it's been in the hand of a Jew ever since then to fulfill God's many promises to David, which I won't be able to get into today. Again, it's until Shiloh come. Now, those are the five proofs, biblical proofs, and the strongest proof, brethren, of what Mr. Armstrong wrote, and nearly all of it was from the Bible. Mr. Armstrong gave virtually no history, contrary to what some were saying, like, you know, he didn't really, you know, have much history. Well, you bet he didn't. He wasn't trying to prove it from history. He was proving from the Bible, and you, can, you can't find, I don't think, either two or three pages where he really mentions history in, in the whole Bible. I mean, if you eliminate the biblical history, yes. He wasn't trying to prove it from history. But that's what some of us have researched, and we have the history to prove it as well. Now, point number one. Let's start on that this afternoon, and um, let's begin. The eternal God determines which nations will inherit which areas of the earth at any given time in history. Notice Acts 17, 24 through 26. Quote, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord, that is, it means master or ruler, he is Lord of heaven and earth and has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. 
And, notice, the same God, it says, has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God determines which people will inherit which land at any given time. And he gave Palestine as a tiny little land to the 12 tribes of Israel, but he said they wouldn't stop there. That wouldn't be the end. He said they'll spread abroad and would become millions and hundreds of millions of people as they are today. That's prophesied in the Bible. God is the one who determines those things. Notice also another scripture back in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. When God decided which nations would inherit what portions of the earth, he reserved, notice, the best portions of this world for his people Israel. That's race, not grace. Notice it, Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. When the Most High, that is the Most High God, divided, that is appointed or, or separated, to the nations their inheritance, that is, he determined which nations would inherit which portion of the earth, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people, that is, the non-Israelite people, the Gentile nations, in other words, according to the number of the children of Israel. He determined those Gentiles would inherit certain possessions, and he set those possessions according to the number of Israelites that would later be born and would inhabit these rich lands. I've got a book, which someday I'll quote you, and speaking of this North American continent, especially the continental part of the United States, it says this, this secular writer, he says, it's as though God was keeping this land, and he, it's not, they're not people who believe in we're Israel, was keeping this land and it was like it was hidden for our people, so when we came over here, we could inherit it. And that was, uh, I think, written by someone basically along the lines of manifest destiny, but they did not believe we were Israel. They just did not, the, the framers of so-called manifest destiny, but that's another subject. So again, God set the Gentiles in their places, and he allowed the Canaanites to have squatters' lights, uh, rights in Palestine until the time came the Israelites were to be given that. And they came in. God allowed even the, you know, I've got a map here to show. On this map, and I can read it, it says that the ancient Phoenicians, that is, they were Canaanites, who established colonies in Carthage in North Africa, in, in Spain called Nova Cartagena, in southeast Spain, who occupied Sicily. You know, they also had a colony up in southern Ireland. And all Irish history shows there were some rather darkish people living there before the Tuatha de Danon, the tribe or people of Dan came in there. And you know who, who these people were? Yes, it, it says they were Africans. They were from North Africa. But they were people who had come from North Africa. Before that, they were down, they were Canaanites, like the ancient Canaanites who dwelt, you know, there in, in the eastern seaboard and who established colonies in North Africa. And this map that I have also says this Southern Ireland, or it mentioned, it shows it on the map, and it says the ultimate Phoenician habitation. This was the furthest they had gone to actually establish a colony, and they were trying to take possession of Ireland, but eventually they were wiped out when the people of Dan came in from Greece. And I'll show you how they got to Greece, God willing, in a future sermon. And that's mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned in Josephus. It's mentioned in, in a number of secular books that some of those Danites that left Palestine long before the captivity, and some of them resided for a while in Greece, and this is mentioned, in many histories and secular books, uh, people that don't believe were Israel, and they say these were none, uh, none other than the people of the tribe of Dan. Now, God is the one that he allowed certain people to inhabit the North American continent. The, they had squatters' rights, certain tribes. It's interesting, most of the Indian tribes dwelt south of the border in Mexico. The real masses, there's where their big cities and the real population was, but the but uh, the best reports I've seen, only they think of one and a half million, maybe a, a very few million, two or three million Indians inhabited this continent when our forefathers came here. It was a little cold, much of it, and inhospitable, and they were, it was sparsely inhabited by the Indians. They had squatter's rights, but God intended this continent to go to Joseph, the peoples of Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, notice what Abraham Lincoln says. Well... Let's uh, mention this. When God set the bounds of the Gentiles, he kept in mind the number of the children of Israel who would later possess these fat places of the earth, these rich lands which Israel was foreordained to inherit by divine fiat, that is, by God's divine command. God ordained it. President Abraham Lincoln recognized 
that America had received its rich lands as a blessing directly from the hand of Almighty God. And here's what President Lincoln, who most people still consider our greatest president, here's what he said. We, that is the people of the United States, we find ourselves in the peaceful possession of the fairest portion of the earth as regards fertility of soil, extent of territory, and salubrity of climate. That is the best climate. And that's what God promised the descendants of Jacob would have. Plenty, plenty of dew, which you get in a good climate. You don't get a lot over in the deserts and, and some of the you know, uh, Arctic regions. We find ourselves the legal and inheritors of these fundamental blessings. We toiled not in the acquirement of these, uh, of these blessings. No, wait. Uh, of these fundamental blessings. We toiled not in the acquirement or the establishment of them, he says. We have been the recipients of the choicest blessings of heaven. No human counsel hath devised nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God. End quote. Abraham Lincoln. He recognized God Almighty had given us this land and manifest destiny where many thought it was our manifest destiny that God had destined we would inhabit the land from the Pacific to the Atlantic. It was manifest destiny. And of course, uh, I don't mean everything that our ancestors did was right and when they came out and, and in some cases slaughtered perhaps in a way that they shouldn't and, and did certain things, but still God had given this to us. And carnal people never always do things right, you know. Even spiritual people in the church make mistakes, you know. Or have you noticed that? Look in the mirror sometime <laughs> if, you, if you doubt that. Furthermore, President Lincoln also stated, quote, the beneficent creator and ruler of the universe, the great disposer of events, that is, he said he was the one who could give harmony throughout the land which it hath pleased him, listen, this land of America, it has pleased him to assign as a dwelling place for ourselves and for our posterity throughout all generations. Abraham Lincoln. Our greatest president said that. God Almighty solemnly promised that the descendants of Israel would be given the choicest portions of this earth for their inheritance. Notice this quote back in Genesis. Now, Genesis 27. Let's go back and look at one of these quotes. Oh, I guess that's about the only one we'll have time. So I'm going to close at four, and I want to close pretty well on time. But let's at least notice this one promise. Uh, and we, we've only got into one of these basic things today, but that's all right. There'll be other times. I've never been able to preach the whole Bible in, in one sermon. And I, I, I bring up enough things here if I quoted them to keep us for days. But I, if I think if I want something, I can pull it out, you know, and I never know how I hope God will inspire me. And I always have, um, oh, I've got a few scores of, of papers here I'd like to quote for him to pr uh, prove some of these things. But anyway, let's notice. Notice Genesis 27, verses 28 and 29. Therefore, God give thee of the dew of heaven, that is, temperate climate, and the fatness, and the Hebrew says, fat places, literally, the fat places of the earth. Let people, that is, the non-Israelite Gentiles, serve thee. Yes, other nations have served us. And nations bow down to thee, or to you. The Lord, no, rather, be Lord, that is, you be Lord, that is, master or ruler, over your brethren. Cursed be everyone that curses you, and blessed is everyone that blesses you. That's the King James Version. Think of World War II. Think of the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. But what happened when the Japanese cities, even before the A-bomb, many of them were leveled by carpet bombing and these B-36s uh, B or whatever they were at the time. Anyway, these big bombers that, and, that, uh, that just leveled much of Tokyo and Yokohama and, and many of the other industrial cities of Japan. Even before we gave them a quick one-two the knockout punch with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the Germans, as Harry Truman said, were working feverishly on the A-bomb and mercifully. That's a, a very interesting story. God gave us, and, and he caused the very uh, policy of Hitler to drive out the Jews, Enrico Fermi, uh, Albert Einstein, and others who were brilliant scientists in, in, um, in what later became occupied Germany. They were driven out, and those were the very Jews that, uh, that spearheaded and masterminded the A-bomb that it gave us the weapon that gave us supremacy if we'd wanted to over all nations on the earth. 
Yes, God gave us the fat places of the earth. It is interesting to note that dry desert-like lands receive very little dew comparatively. And also the Arctic regions, you don't think you ever have dew up, you know, in the cold regions uh, um, where um, you have a lot of snow. Now, note how this promise of material wealth and greatness is worded in the Moffat translation. And I'll not keep you much longer. I guess I can go just a little longer, can I? We must have got started late. Uh, Doctor, uh, Mr. Meredith must have uh, uh, gone on too long in those announcements. I don't know. But anyway, I'll, I'll not keep you much longer. I, I, I sometimes go a little over, but I've disciplined myself and don't go much over usually. But anyway, note, note how this promise of material wealth and greatness is worded, as I said, in the Moffat translation. And I quote the Moffat. God grant you dew from heaven and rich soil upon the earth, corn and wine in plenty. May nations be your servants and races bow before you. Well, um, that is what happened. The rich soil. There's no soil in the earth as rich as a Many of the thousands of square miles along the Mississippi, Ohio, Arkansas, Missouri rivers, other rivers all over this nation. And there's no, like, there's no comparison in Africa, in Europe, in Russia where they have an inhospitable climate. The Russians were going to bury us and they went out and they plowed up some of their, you know, some of their uh, steppe lands and, and the wind blew it away and, and, and they found out they just didn't have the soil or the climate. They've got some good soil, but it doesn't compare with what God gave us. So here we find very clearly what God promised. Now when Jacob's brother Esau learned that his father Isaac had so blessed Jacob, who was later called Israel, Esau became very embittered. Notice Esau's bitter lament in verse uh, 36. He, that is Jacob, here's what he told his father, he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. Remember, he sold it for a bowl of soup. He, wasn't, he, he didn't try, treat it as, as worth anything. And God wanted a man that at least would appreciate it when he gave it to Jacob. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. Esau's father Isaac then told his son uh, Esau, he said, quote, I have made him your Lord, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. That's verse 37. Isaac also told Esau that he would receive a lesser blessing. And so he says, behold, your blessing shall be the fatness of the earth. Now, the King James says the fatness of the earth. That is not a correct translation. Many translations, the revised version and the Moffat, uh, word it differently. It should be, your blessing shall be away from the fatness of the earth, away from the dew of heaven. In fact, the Moffat translation uh, uh, says this. Um, well, first, behold, away from the fatness of the earth, shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. That's the Revised Standard Version. And the Moffat says, Far from rich soil on earth shall you live, far from the dew of heaven on high. End quote. That's the Moffat. You see, they were not to be given these fabulous blessings of a temperate climate with plenty of, of the dew of heaven. I used to walk out through on the farm and early in the morning many times, take a couple steps in the grass or the hay, and my trousers would be wet from the dew. And the ground would literally be wet like it had rained. Because we lived near the Miss in the Mississippi Valley area, or very near it there, and we got a lot of dew, and usually quite a bit of rain. Enough. Uh, if, well, anyway, I'm going to have to break off here, and and just say I haven't even completed number one, and I want to show you some fantastic statements how we became the well the breadbasket. Well, I'll just just say we became the breadbasket of the world. We're still called that. Aliens are uh, lining up. Maybe I could just complete this this section by saying this that. Uh, that around the world, uh, Gentile nations are flooding across U.S. borders. Their, uh, aliens are lining up in U.S. embassies. Countless thousands of would-be immigrants are lining uh, up in one way or another through, through uh, illegal or legal means trying to get into the United States. The flesh pots of Manasseh, the great fantastic blessings God gave Joseph. Yes, they want to immigrate to the United States so they can partake of the fatness which God promised to the descendants of Israel or Jacob over three and a half thousand years ago. California alone, if it were a separate nation, would have an annual gross domestic product, or we used to call it G GNP, greater than all but I think it's six nations on earth. If California were a sovereign country, it would be the sixth rich and r richest nation on earth. Furthermore, even though certain other countries such as France Scandinavia, Holland, Belgium, and Switzerland have also inherited rich productive portions of this earth. They have not received as great material wealth 
and prosperity, as have the nations who have descended from Joseph, the United States, and the British Commonwealth of Nations, that is, Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand especially. Many of these Gentile peoples of the world are also seeking entrance into Britain and Canada and Australia. I've seen that, having visited and lived in some of those places. And New Zealand. And they're flooding into our countries where we have a lot of rich land and rich soil, and that's because God gave it to us, not because of our righteousness. And brethren, that has to do with race and with material wealth and greatness which God Almighty prophesied, and that has come to pass. Now, wait till we look at some of the th other th uh, these proofs from the Bible, and you'll see a lot more, and then someday I hope to even start giving you the history, and it'll almost make the hair on your head stand up when you see what's in the history books that these people won't look at, or if they do, they call it folklore, and, and they won't listen to the plain writings of some of these books that go back hundreds of years that show where our people came from and certainly in many cases directly say they were Israelites from the land of Israel or that they were there in, in, in Egypt at the time of the Exodus and that sort of thing. Well, anyway, brethren, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. As I said, I have both, uh, we have both happiness and joy, but a little twinge with a, a certain sorrow. And um, uh, I hope we will continue to pray for the leaders uh, in uh, the, the worldwide church of God and love them and the ministers. We don't have to pray that God will bless those who are going in error and bless them in their doctrinal errors, but pray that God will, will uh, guide and direct and do whatever he is going to work out, just as we're told to pray for our president and for kings and for all in authority. And we're also to pray for others and certainly pray for uh, Mr. Meredith and uh, for those of us who will be helping to hold his hands up and to see that God's word is restored, that God's work is revived, that people can have the unadulterated truth of God, not mixed with a lot of Protestant swill, not mixed with a lot of error, a lot of theology that does not come from the Bible, a lot of do doctrines that certainly cannot be upheld, and that's what we are here for because we all, I'm sure, support the truth of God, and that's not very popular in the world today.